Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. The beginning part of this video is just going to be me ranting about YouTube. So if that doesn't interest you, and I don't blame you, then uh, I'll put a timestamp on screen now and you can skip ahead to the main content of the video. So a lot of people have been asking me why I haven't made any more Horrible Ways to Die or Trip Report videos. The truth is that these are actually some of the most popular videos on my channel, and some of the ones that I was most interested in making. But ever since I uploaded them I noticed something strange happening with my channel. Once those videos started to get popular I noticed that any time I uploaded anything it would get demonetized instantly. I also noticed that the views on my videos started to suddenly take a massive nosedive. I'm getting about 10% of the views that I used to get. I'm prepared to accept that it could just be that people aren't as interested in the new content as in the stuff I used to be putting out. But it seems like it's just not getting recommended to new viewers like it used to be. The guidelines on YouTube are really clear. If you upload something that violates the terms of service, it gets removed, you get a strike, and then you get told how long the strike will remain in place for. But recently they introduced new policies on what they call borderline content. This is stuff that doesn't quite violate the guidelines, but they still decide they don't want it on their platform. It doesn't seem to be any set rules for what constitutes borderline content. It's just down to the whims of a very faulty AI system and the morals of whoever programmed it. If your content gets flagged as borderline, it doesn't get banned, it just gets throttled. This means that if someone visits your channel, they can see the content there on your channel page, but it won't get recommended to people. So this really kills the reach that a video can get. It means that no new people will get to see the videos. It's very disheartening to work on a channel for years and then have the growth stifled by some shadowy algorithm. At least with a strike you get a message telling you exactly what guideline you violated and how long the strike will last for. With this borderline content throttling there's no way to tell if your account is affected or not. One day your videos just start getting demonetized and your views drop and you're left wondering if it's your fault or if YouTube are doing it deliberately. There's no way of knowing if the throttling can be reversed, or if your channel will be affected by it forever, or what content exactly set it off. It's really frustrating and it kind of leaves you in a sense that you don't really know what you can upload and what you can't. Now I know these videos, especially the horrible ways to die ones, can be a bit edgy, I suppose would be the word. I really try to keep them within the terms of service. I don't use gory or graphic imagery. I don't mock or make light of or glorify tragic events. This is a horror channel and I do try to convey the horror of these situations, but I don't think I violate any guidelines with these videos. I mean, I literally uploaded a video where I talked about the weather for five minutes and that got demonetized. It's it's really strange. Eventually, sometimes they do get remonetized if I submit them for review, but it just leaves me thinking there's some kind of flag on my account that no matter what I upload, it instantly gets demonetized. There must be something in place. It's like a black mark, I feel, is on my account. So I'm left with two choices. Either I can tone down the contents, hoping that one day some invisible punishment will be lifted from my accounts, never quite knowing if what I make is going to get me back in YouTube's good books. Or I could just continue making the content that I actually want to make and that people actually seem to want to watch and then try and earn a living despite YouTube's best efforts to sanitize their platform. Inevitably, this is where the e-begging comes in. If you like this sort of content, there's a few ways I've set up of supporting the channel. I have a PayPal tip jar that I've set up for one-off donations. So if I make a video that you particularly enjoy, consider sending a dollar or two my way. I've also set up a Patreon account. I don't really like Patreon that much. They seem to ban people for arbitrary reasons and I think they stifle free speech in the same way YouTube do. But I've tried the alternatives and they weren't really viable. So I've got one tier on Patreon. It's $2.50 per month. For that, you get access to all my videos 24 hours before they go live on YouTube. You also get the warm satisfaction of helping to support this sort of video being made. Anyway, that's enough of my ranting. I apologise. I put this at the beginning of this video because a lot of people are asking why I haven't made more of them, and I have wanted to. I've just been a bit worried about the way it sort of seemed to send my channel into a nosedive. Okay, on with the video. 
Now this is going to have a lot of Japanese names in here and if you watch these videos regularly you'll know I have a real problem pronouncing things from different languages so I apologize in advance if I'm getting any of these names wrong. As far as these horrible ways to die videos go, the death of Junko Furuta is one of the ones that I get requested to cover the most. Junko Furuta was a bookish 17 year old high school student. She didn't smoke or drink or go to parties. She studied hard and she was considered quite nerdy by her classmates. So it was strange that fellow classmate Hiroshi Miyano took an interest in her. Hiroshi was a violent gang member with Yakuza connections. He was a known troublemaker. He and his group of friends would cruise the streets of Masato, robbing and even abducting girls to gang rape them. He developed a crush on Junko Furuta and when he asked her out on a date she refused him. Incensed by this rejection he vowed to get his revenge. On the 25th of November 1988 Hiroshi Miyano and his friend Nobuharu Minato were out looking for people to rob. They saw Junko cycling home from her part time after school job and a plan was quickly hatched. As she passed by, Nobuharu kicked Junko off her bike and immediately ran away. Hiroshi, playing the part of concerned classmates, then walked up to her and offered to help walk her home. In actual fact, he was walking her to an abandoned warehouse and ultimately to her death. Once in the warehouse, he held her down and raped her, then he took her to a hotel room and raped her twice more. He then invited his friends round to see where he bragged about what he had done. One of his friends suggested that they keep Junko prisoner and then they could use her in any way they wanted. They told Junko that they knew where she lived and that if she tried to escape her family would be murdered by Yakuza. From there they took her to a house owned by Nobuharu's parents where she would be held for the remainder of her ordeal. The gang rapes began almost immediately. In fact, it's believed that Junko was raped over 400 times during the 44 days that she was imprisoned. Each day, multiple low-level Yakuza members would be invited to the house to abuse and torture Junko. When Nobuharu Minato's parents were home, she was made to pose as his girlfriend. Although it quickly became obvious to them that she was being held captive, they feared reprisals from the Yakuza and so they refused to intervene. Two days after her abduction, Junko's parents reported her missing. Hiroshi forced her to phone her parents and tell them that she had run away and was staying with friends. She told her parents to call off the manhunt and to tell the police that she was safe. The suffering that Junko went through in that first week is unimaginable. Along with the constant sexual assaults, she was mentally and physically abused in incomprehensible ways. One of their favourite tortures was to hang her from the ceiling and use her as a human punching bag. She was also starved and when she begged for food, she was made to eat live cockroaches and her own faeces. Her face and genitals were burned with cigarettes and foreign objects including a burning hot light bulb were forced inside her. Around day 11 the abuse increased in intensity. After she tried to escape as punishment they poured lighter fluid onto her legs and feet and then set them alight. They dropped heavy weight onto her stomach causing such damage to her internal organs that she couldn't even drink water without vomiting. Her head was held down to a concrete floor and they took turns jumping on her face, causing her nose to fill with so much blood that she could only breathe through her mouth. Amazingly, around this time, word got to the police that Junko was being held captive at the Minato residence. When they went to investigate, Nobuharu Minato's parents denied that she was there and invited the police into the house to take a look around. They took this invitation as proof that Junko wasn't there. After all, why would you invite the police inside if you had a girl captive in there? They went away without even entering the property. This was probably her last chance to escape and the police failed her completely. The beatings and the abuse continued. By the 30th day, 
Due to the beatings and the starvation, her brain had severely shrunk in size. This caused Junko to start having seizures. The gang believed that she was faking the convulsions, and so they tortured her even more as punishment. They smashed her hands with heavy weights, breaking all the bones in her fingers. A firework was inserted into her anus and lit. Sewing needles were stabbed into her breasts, and one of her nipples was torn off with pliers. She was forced to sleep outside on a balcony. Bear in mind that at this time it was late December, so her body would have been completely frozen. By this point she was so completely broken that it would take her over an hour to drag herself downstairs just to use the toilet. In the end she lost control of her bladder completely, causing her to urinate on herself which inevitably led to even more punishments. By day 40 she was completely unable to move from where she lay on the floor. She begged her captors to kill her and end her suffering. On the 44th day, they made Junko play them in a game of Mahjong. When she won the game, as punishment they beat her with iron bars and burned her eyelids shut with candle wax. By this point her body was so covered with wounds that were infected and leaking pus that they had to tape plastic bags over their hands to stop themselves touching her infected body. They then held her upright and severely beat her feet with a bamboo stick. During this time she began having convulsions and collapsed. They then doused her head with lighter fluid and set her alight. She made a futile attempt to extinguish the flames but gradually began to fall unconscious. This was the final straw for her battered body. After more than six weeks of constant abuse, she finally succumbed to death. By this point, however, they were so used to Junko passing out for long periods of times that they failed to realize that she was dead for another 24 hours. To dispose of the body, they forced her corpse into a 55 gallon drum, filled it with concrete and disposed of it in the Koto ward of Tokyo. Some weeks later, whilst being questioned regarding a gang rape which the boys had committed the previous year, one of them broke down and confessed to the murder of Junko Furuta, and then they told the police where to find the body. When her corpse was recovered, the face was so battered that she was unrecognisable and had to be identified by her fingerprints. It's believed that over 100 people knew that Junko Furuta was being imprisoned at the Mayano residence, many of them actively taking part in the abuse, but in the end only four people were arrested for the crimes. Hiroshi Miyano, Nobuharu Minato, Yasushi Watanabe and Joe Ogura. The boys were considered juveniles at the time of the trial and so they were given considerably light sentences. Hiroshi Miyano, being the ringleader, got 20 years imprisonment, but the others only got between 5 and 9 year sentences each. All of them are out of jail now and assumed to be living normal lives. It's thought that their Yakuza connections had a part to play in their light sentencing and offered them some sort of protection from the understandably angry general public after their release. Junko's mother on the other hand, upon hearing of the abuse that her daughter suffered and knowing that it was herself who called off the police search, had a complete mental breakdown and was committed to a mental asylum. For her, it was a life sentence of unimaginable anguish. And that's the story of Junko Furuta, a promising student whose life was cut short in the most horrifying way imaginable. The brutality of the crime and the leniency of the sentences reminds me a lot of the Suzanne Kappa case which I covered in another video. When I hear about stories like this, I always hope that although they got light punishments, the memory of their crimes eats away at them for the rest of their lives. Sadly, I don't think psychopaths like this have much remorse for their actions at all. Hiroshi Mayano is living under a false identity to protect him. Nobuharu Minato moved in with his mother after getting released from prison and is living there rent free, not working a day in his life. Yasushi Watanabe left prison, got married and is living a happy normal life. And Joe Ogura re-offended in 2004, imprisoned a man he suspected of having an affair with his wife, beat him for four hours, 
was imprisoned under another light sentence and then was released again, supposedly living a happy normal life. And on that cheerful note, I'm going to end the video here. If you're not feeling depressed enough already, check out the other videos in the series. If you want something a bit more lighthearted, I'll put a link to that in the end card. A big thank you to those supporting me on Patreon, Damon Smith, Christy Jones and Rocket Guitarist. Thank you very much. Until next time, goodbye.